Hello, and thank you for tuning into Answers from the Lab, where we share Mayo Clinic knowledge and advancements on the state of testing and science from laboratory leaders and the people who are making it happen behind the scenes. I'm Dr. Bobby Pritt, the Chair of the Division of Clinical Microbiology in the Department of Laboratory Medicine and Pathology at Mayo Clinic in Rochester, Minnesota. With me today is Dr. Bill Maurice, the Chair of the Department of Laboratory Medicine and Pathology at Mayo Clinic and the President of Mayo Clinic Laboratories. This is our weekly discussion with Dr. Maurice in which we learn about updates in the field of laboratory medicine and pathology. Well, hello everyone. Uh, today we actually have two guests. In addition to Bill Maurice, we have Matt Vinegar, who's been a frequent guest on our podcast. So hello, Bill and Matt. Hey, Dr. Pritt. Glad to Hi. be here. Hi, Dr. Pritt and Dr. Vinegar. Glad to be here. It's, a, it's classic Mayo teamwork, right? We're all That's exactly together right. to answer yeah. questions. Because there's a lot of them still out there for people. There are a lot of questions. And, you know, I got to spend some time with family uh, recently, and I got a lot of questions from them. So it made me think, you know, there's still a lot of myths out there about vaccines. Um, vaccination is very important. I looked at the CDC tracker today. It looks like 74.1% of Americans have received at least one dose. Uh, even though that's encouraging, there's still quite a ways to go. And the CDC also shows that community transparency transmission of COVID is now rated as high across all the continental U.S. states, except for Vermont, which is at moderate and uh, probably isn't far behind. So I thought today would be a good day to talk about vaccination and maybe debunk some of those myths. We've done that before. So I, I'll call this debunking vaccine myths part two. Um, yeah. Sounds you know, good. I can tell you, I heard all sorts of crazy things and those um, I think we could debunk easily, you know, that vaccines don't contain microchips. Uh, they're not designed to track our movements. I don't know. What have the two of you heard? Um, any crazy ones or any, you know, we could talk about our, our favorite myths, so to speak. There's my picture up there, but not my actual video picture, unlike Dr. Pritt and Dr. Miniker, because I had a bit of a mishap on my bike mm -hmm. yesterday. You know, one of the myths that uh, I continue to hear is just really, I think, an overplaying of the risk of the vaccine. I think that's more than the microchips and some of the other stuff which sounded mm -hmm. outlandish. Although, uh, two things, people have wound it into a narrative of somehow this is governmental control and overstepping boundaries when it really is just public health. And the other is, I think, now the risks of the vaccine itself are being overblown in many circles. That's kind of the, the big ones I'm hearing. I mean, one of the common ones is that the you know vaccines are being used to track movements. And you know, there's a better way if, if there's interest in tracking our movements and it's you know with our phones. So there's there's really not a a need to uh, to do that through vaccination. So um, you know the vaccines are were really developed in response to a public health emergency and and are been shown to be effective in preventing disease. So that's what we got to focus the conversation on for sure. Yeah, I agree. I think the one thing that we struggle with as a healthcare community is there were some, you know, heightened expectations about the vaccine. There was such hope that when the early efficacy looked so high, that this was really going to be highly effective. As you pointed out, Dr. Binnaker, Matt, that this is not a sterilizing vaccine. I mean, though even the concept of quote breakthrough isn't really necessarily a valid one because we knew it wasn't hundred percent effective. So, but I think that's the other thing in terms of just not really debunking a myth, but getting people to understand that this still is the best tool that we have available to fight the pandemic, that what we're seeing is not entirely unexpected. And it just shows that we really are in this for the long haul to get through this, I think. Yeah, you know, I would agree with all of that. And, and we have more good news. I didn't even mention earlier that uh, the FDA has approved the Pfizer vaccine and, and Moderna has been submitted. So I think we have more safety data than ever showing these are safe vaccines. I'd like to kind of add on to what you were saying, um, you know, the vaccines aren't perfect, sure, uh, but then no vaccine is. And yet we've tackled some very serious diseases over the ages. And one of the things I heard from family members and friends, people uh, back home where I was from on uh, Vermont in the Northeast is, well, if the vaccines actually worked, then we wouldn't need boosters. When is this going to end? Uh, we're just going to have to keep getting boosters. Uh, well, remember that we already get boosters for 
all of our vaccines essentially, or, or nearly all of them. Um, and, and that's natural to re-stimulate your immune system from time to time to keep it primed so it's ready to protect you when it encounters that foreign pathogen. And so I went back and I looked at the list of all of our childhood vaccines. And just so for a common example, uh, the combined vaccine for diphtheria, tetanus, and pertussis actually has four doses given over the first 15 months of life. So you are continuously priming the immune system, stimulating it, getting it ready to protect you. Um, and then other vaccines, such as the measles, mumps, rubella vaccine, you're given usually between 12 to 15 months, a second dose at four to six years. And then later throughout life, if vaccination, if your immunity is waning, you may be given another booster later or titers check to see if you still have adequate antibody protection. So so I think it's it's natural to think that our immune system will kind of go down over time. And then just this periodic boosting is a natural part of keeping our immune system ready to protect you. Yeah. And also uh, influenza is a, another example where right. we get annual vaccinations for two, two reasons. One, because those antibodies in response to vaccination do uh, wane over time or decrease over time. But two, the virus changes and that's going to also occur with SARS-CoV-2, as we know that there are new variants arising and there will continue to be new strains emerging in the future. So vaccination is kind of a, a double-pronged approach or boosters are a double-pronged approach, one, to re-stimulate the immune system and two, to keep up with emerging strains. I was just going to add one last thing, um, another thing that people have said, well, what if you have the infection naturally? Uh, that should protect you, right? And even naturally acquired immunity from having the infection itself and rather than uh, vaccine induced immunity, that will wane over time as well. So think about chickenpox uh, caused by a virus, another virus, uh, varicella zoster. Um, and I had chickenpox as a kid, but later in life, I would probably get a vaccine to prevent reactivation of that virus to prevent a, a very painful recurrence uh, called zoster. So even with natural immunity, there is some waning over time. And now it's recommended that everyone get this vaccine to avoid getting zoster later in life. Yep. So great yeah. examples. Yeah, I agree. I mean, I think we have to remember, look, there's a lot of controversy of people mm -hmm. swirling around these vaccines for a lot of different reasons. But the reality is that vaccines are a mainstay of public health. They have been. They have been really transformative going back to the smallpox vaccine. They have been a transformative tool in humans' ability to fight infectious disease. And this is no different, to be completely honest. And the other thing I would just point out from a completely personal perspective is you have to take into consideration that the choices that you're making around vaccines really do impact not just you, but the, those around you. So yesterday, uh, I had a bike accident. I had, to, had facial trauma. I had to go into the emergency room. I had to have an, a resident spend five hours stitching my face. I got to hear the conversation talking about having to manage unvaccinated patients and how much more difficult that is for them because of the risk that they feel. Look, I didn't plan on smashing my face. You just don't know what's going to happen in, in life. And to take something that's cruelly preventative, thank God I had a bike helmet on yesterday because I knew it helped keep me safe. I didn't plan on crashing into something, but I knew it would keep me safe. Not the most comfortable thing sometimes, especially when it's hot, but, you know, and thank God I had it on. When you really start to think about, because we get caught up in a lot of the, just the swirl around the vaccine and the dialogue, and it becomes very theoretical and what it could do this and could do that. But the reality is that it can protect you. We know that they're safe. They're like any drug. It's not risk-free. The choice that you make it not only impacts you, but it impacts a lot of other people as well. Really well said, Bill. Well, I think we've covered a lot of uh, vaccine myths. Uh, are there any others that either of you had that you'd like to mention? One that comes to mind is that uh, getting the uh, vaccine will either give you COVID or cause you to test positive for COVID. So I think it'll be important for us to address that one. Mm -hmm. um, the, the COVID vaccines that are common actually uh, cause our body to generate an immune response against a specific viral protein, not the actual virus itself um, doesn't generate the virus itself. So um, getting the COVID vaccines will not cause you to come down with COVID. Um, it may cause you to have some mild um, symptoms like uh, body aches, uh, just being tired, 
uh, maybe some soreness at the injection site uh, for typically less than 24 hours, but it won't give you COVID. And then it also won't cause you to test positive for COVID because um, again, the antibodies that are generated in response to the vaccine are in, within your bloodstream and the tests that are performed for COVID are using samples collected from your respiratory tract, like your nose. Um, and those um, proteins and antibodies aren't present in your um, nasal tract after vaccination. Yeah, that's a really good one, Matt. I'll add on to that. Um, you, you mentioned that the vaccines induce your body to produce um, an immune response. Uh, the vaccines in that process are not altering your DNA. Uh, they're not shedding or releasing any of their components. They don't contain a live virus like some of our other vaccines do actually. It's not even a killed or a weakened stage of a virus. So it can't proliferate or shed into your body. Um, so that's also important to remember. And I know some people are a little nervous about, you know, will it get into my DNA? Will it change my DNA? It will not, it can't actually. It doesn't enter the nucleus where we store our DNA to begin with. Yeah, I guess the myths that I've been hearing, Bobby, that are still out there, a lot about vaccinated people are shedding spike protein that mm -hmm. can then be toxic to people around them. I mean, the whole point to, to Matt's point, Dr. Benneker's point is that your body creates an immune response to it. So it destroys the protein and the vaccines, the mRNA is very short lived. Right. So the idea that somehow vaccinated people are shedding something toxic to those around them. And the other is there's a lot of talk about the spike protein being a, in air quotes, bioweapon because it you know came out of a lab in China. And the reality is that, first of all, I mean, Matt knows this better than you or I, but I mean, spike proteins are on a lot of different coronaviruses. This one's different. It's unique to, to COVID, but it's not completely unique. Plus, irrespective of the origins of the virus, I would rather have it in a controlled situation where I can eradicate it because if you get infected with, with COVID, guess what? You've got spike protein and spike RNA in your body. So those are the things that I've heard that I, I think are a little bit uh, far-fetched. That's a good point, Bill. Would you rather have it in an uncontrolled natural infection where we know the consequences of are, are very high, you know, a potential severe outcome or even just a bad out, uh, prolonged symptoms, long COVID, um, or would you rather get exposed in a controlled manner with a vaccine that will protect you from actual infection and disease and death? Yep. So it seems like a clear answer to me. One other uh, myth that I've been seeing recently is that it's the vaccinated population that's driving emergence of new variants. And so I think it's important, you know, to address that. Um, so the the rise of new strains of SARS-CoV-2, all as a result of more people being infected. So when large numbers of people are infected, the virus can enter our cells and replicate. And when replication happens, um, in some instances, very rare circumstances, the virus can mutate and and actually gain an ability to spread easier or be transmitted more efficiently from person to person. So again, if infections occur, then mutations can arise. Mm -hmm. And we know that vaccination doesn't completely prevent infection, but we know that it likely uh, reduces the chance of infection. It probably decreases the amount of time that someone is infected. So in other words, getting vaccinated is going to reduce the chance of being infected or reduce the amount of time that you're infected and reduce the chances that the virus can replicate and mutate. So uh, really it's all about trying to decrease the number of infections that occur that will result in less mutations arising in the future. Yeah, very well said. Well, I think we covered a lot of good myths. I know that there's many more out there. Um, you know, like we said, some of the ones that maybe would be a little less believable, you know, vaccines don't make you magnetic. Uh, but I think some of the ones that really have a lot of people worried as well. So, um, you know, keep keep uh, coming with uh, these different myths. Uh, let us know, you as listeners, if any of you would like us to uh, talk about additional myths, we'd love to hear from you. Uh, and we'll just keep doing our best to get that information out there. And I'd really like to thank uh, Dr. Maurice and Dr. Binninger for joining me today on this session for Debunking Myths Part Two. Maybe there'll be a part three. 
Yeah, my pleasure. Well, hopefully not. And I would just say, yeah. uh, urge people to really make sure. I mean, a lot of this, I think, reflects an undermining of people's trust in the healthcare yeah. system and some of our agencies, even FDA. And I think a lot of that can be bred by not going to really reliable resources for your information. Well, that's why we're doing this. It's a real honor to get to be on with you, both of you. Go to mayoclinic.org. Go to another healthcare systems you know that you trust. Go to, to FDA and CDC. If, if you don't trust those, there's a lot of health organizations that are putting out very good information. Mm-hmm. Go to those. As physicians and scientists in healthcare, our only goal is to help our society get through this. That's, that is our only agenda. And so the information we put out there is for exactly that purpose. So that's the other thing I would encourage people to do. Very nicely said, Bo. We're here to help our patients and help people stay safe. Exactly. All right. Well, until next time, it was great talking to both of you. See you guys later. Thank you. Okay. Bye. Bye. Thank you so much for tuning in to Answers from the Lab. Be sure to subscribe to this podcast and don't forget to tune in every Thursday and every other Tuesday.